We will. Um, there's only so much you can talk about uh, mycopesticides. So we've got about an hour of this, and then I've tacked on some bonus footage since it's my last talk, and I get separation anxiety from you guys. And I will talk about morel cultivation and some research we're doing. Just some fun stuff to end out the day. Cool things to dream about. All right. So um, starting out, we're going to um, just talk a little bit about what interactions are, are possible here with microbes and uh, plants, animals, all this. I call those inner kingdom interactions. And it's important to know this. It's a good uh, microbial ecology lesson for here. So you can keep this in your toolkit, your mental toolkit. You may or may not need it. You probably will. Um, we're surrounded by organisms that want what we want. So we have to be competitive and use every tool we have. Uh, what's, what's good about these are that, especially with the insect pests, like uh, Boberia and Cordyceps, that those spores are typically adhesive and they'll stick to the cuticle of an insect, meaning they'll uh, recognize, uh, they'll stick to a lot of insects, but they won't recognize that many. So if they're more target specific and they rec recognize a specific insect, uh, the chemistry of their um, exoskeleton, for instance, they will um, melt or drill a peg right through their wall if they recognize it being compatible. Uh, it's called an oppressorium. And then they'll reach, re release blastospores uh, into that insect to help mummify it. We'll get to that in a minute. But that's what's interesting about entomopathogens is they, some of them are, can be very narrowly focused and more target specific than, uh, well, very well better suited than our chemical pesticides, right? If you, really, if you read, uh, if you just go by the label, the beautiful colored labels that are, that are out there, you would think that fire ant killers just kill fire ants. The only picture of a fire ant on the cover. But if you look it up through the EPA, if you look up through the, uh, the, the toxicity, it kills a lot of different insects, uh, mammals, birds, I mean, just a huge host of different things. So by far, these are more target specific than chemical pesticides. So kind of see this talk as a view of getting away from those uh, over-counter drugs called pesticides. Uh, these are some images by, uh, some of them are by Todd Elliott, and some of them are from myself and Olga. Uh, just some examples of what to look for. If you are in your garden or out in the woods or in the city and um, you are scanning plants and looking around in mulch and mosses and things, you might find your, your first cordyceps. How many of you have ever found a cordyceps mushroom? Mark, is Charlie here? Okay, so just a few. So here's your homework assignment. If I come back next year, um, following that stripper act, if I'm allowed to, um, I want everybody to try to find a cordyceps this year uh, in your garden or in the woods. They're out there. And they're very, once you find one, you get tuned in. You can actually find a lot more. They're, they're there, you just don't see them. All right, so they're kind of hiding. Uh, some of those, uh, these are the structures like this. Can only, this is the only visible part of that fungus right there. So that's like the length of your fingernail. So you can see how easy they are to miss. Um, we've been walking by these for, for years and I've never even looked at them, dug, dug them up, or even wondered what they were. So um, if you find any of these, you can turn them in, and I'll, I'll give you directions on how to turn them in. But these are some beetles. These are leafhopper cloveria. All right, so sometimes they don't produce a structure. If you see an insect in your garden, uh, that, um, and typically you'll find these in organic gardens, and only organic gardens, and why is that? because the pesticides are killing everything else, all right? And uh, you're, you're losing all the biodiversity. So if, you, if I'm looking around, I'm gonna go to uh, like the Clemson Student Organic Farm or some friends I know, or even in my own garden itself. So you can look around, and if you see uh, an insect that looks different, a little bit strange, uh, it has a structure out of it, like these beetles have those structures, or if it's just fuzzy and white. So typically when I see these insects, uh, they're typically in the sun, and they're not, they're not this fuzzy here. This is an asphagnum forest here. But um, you would just see the bugs sitting there, just kind of like sitting there, not doing anything. And if you turn them over, turn them upside down, their entire cuticle, their armor underneath, will be fully mummified, and you'll see the fungus coming out. And I'll show you what 
I'll show you what that looks like. That's pretty cool. I get your heart racing too, because that's your first. And you'll never forget your first, right? Okay. I mean, some of these are absolutely beautiful. Um, well, not to that moth, right? I mean, that had to hurt. That's what I would call a bad hair day. You know, and typically these fungi will attack the insects and they will steer them around the forest, fly them or make them crawl to the position that's most favorable for the fungus to fruit, right? Like a remote control. And they'll more often than not, they will uh, glue the insect to its food source, uh, the, the fungi's food source. So typically they're uh, touching it or they're gripping it. And we're gonna look at all kinds of different postures that these insects do. And I, I walked right past, you know, hunting for mushrooms and I see grasshoppers sitting on the tops of grasses and they're fully gripped around the end of the grass. And then, you know, it's kind of like going up to the insects and just doing like, you know, hey, what's going on everybody? And it, normally those bugs would just fly off. So you do that, you get closer. I just poke, I poke a lot of insects in, in the woods. Just poke at them. Just poke and, you know. And sometimes they're still alive and they're in the zombie state. They're just sitting there like fully, like gripping the grass or the branch and they're just like this, probably thinking something's wrong, you know? <laughs> Um, in, it's, it's, it's guessing, but uh, there could be an antimapathogen for every insect on the planet. Because insects are the largest king, right? And you have these insects who are trying to take over and eat up the world, and you have fungi being number two, who are trying to win five for the first place position. So there are fungi here, there's cockroaches, um, beetles, and uh, Olga and I found one just like this in a lawn chair that we were pulling out for the spring. So those chairs were put up all winter long and then we unfolded a lawn chair and out falls a fully mummified German cockroach. <laughs> right. Imagine that. A fungus that's target specific for these cockroaches. Be on the lookout for problematic insects. Can you name a few uh, problematic insects? Emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer. Yeah. Brown mulberry stink bug. Brown mulberry stink bug. Japanese beetle. Right. I mean, the dead. You're looking at the deadliest animal on the planet right there. Yeah. Uh, aphids. These little leaf sucking organisms. There. Uh, these were actually turned in by Todd Elliott. I took this photo when he uh, when we turned them in because we re mummified a whole host of more aphids. So this is a fungus. Do you see how they look like? Um, when you're looking under the leaves of your plants, especially in your garden, look for this. They might be there. They might, you might find mummified bugs that are positioning themselves. Look at, what's the most prominent position here? Can you tell me? Okay. We're on the veins, look at this. And here, so what happens is these fungi sometimes instruct the biting insects to tap into the main artery of the plant, and then they'll melt the jaw muscles of that insect and give it lock jaw. So then the, the, the fungus kills the insect and threads into the vascular part of that leaf tissue and mines the nutrients and then produces the fungus last. That's pretty creative, man. Yep, Mark. Won't that happen the other way too if these edible pathogens are endophytes and the, the insects feed on the plant, they'll be, become infected? Yeah, they? yeah, we're gonna talk about endophytes too. Is that, that, um, The fact that um, we should not be using systemic fungicides, that's like going nuclear on our plants because there could be fungi in these leaves that are protecting the plants themselves. And those endophytes could also be entomopathogens. In fact, I've isolated a few from some um, uh, water oak plants in my backyard. So there they are positioning themselves, and so that's what you look for. Underneath the bottoms of your leaves, all right, and we'll talk about what you can do with these, with or without a lab. If you don't have a lab, um, try to turn them into someone who does. You can uh, turn them into me or someone else, I'll, I'll deal with them. So as you can see, you can kind of get used to training your eyes to different structures. It's obviously not normal looking, <laughs> right? Um, some of them just powder up and have the anamorph, the powdery state, and some will have a teleomorph, will have this state where it actually produces a little structure. All right, so those are cordyceps mushrooms coming out. Here's a few more, some grubs. Wouldn't that be nice, huh? 
drugs. Put that out on your lawn. <laughs> <laughs> so here's how it happens in some other insects I wanna tell you about, is that um, this is a typical life cycle rotation of an ant, by example, because this is what I study the most are ants. So you have the ant uh, or an insect um, generally uh, feeding and collecting food, uh, sometimes for queens, and then you've got them out. If they track through this fungus, which typically exists as a saprophyte, which means it, can, it has the ability to eat dead and decaying matter uh, in an alternate mold state. It doesn't need uh, an insect around. So it stays in that state. So think of this like a figure eight. Does everybody see that figure eight in the background that I painted? So it's on this track, and if you think of it like a train, it's on this track, and as soon as the right host comes along that it can penetrate, that it recognizes specifically that um, stink bug or that grub or that ant, then it jumps, jumps the track, and now it gets into this life cycle, which where it drills its way through the armor, and then it steers it around into the forest. And that's when it gets real interesting because some of these ants will climb up and down trees, up and down to find the right humidity where that fungus likes to fruit. And then it'll go back and forth and left and right. And why does it go left and right? Because once it reaches the right height and the right spot, it's positioning itself. You can tie little strings to these ants and go down to the ground and they per line up perfectly with the pheromone-laced highway that the rest of their buddies are using. It's like they're pos positioning themselves right over I-95 for the rest of everybody else. It's like a dirty bomb poof, to drop more spores down and infect more of that group. Good luck sleeping in that. <laughs> oh, and this one was cool. Daniel Winkler took this picture. Um, his name is down here, it got cut off. So Daniel Winkler took this photo. This is behind my house in South Carolina. So they're here, they're here. Uh, a lot of different ants and bugs. Uh, the Appalachian Mountains are some of the most uh, fungal diverse for cordyceps in North America. So we should be out here looking for them. This is a uh, Easter egg hunt, right? It's a treasure. You go out, look at, or look right, right where this one positioned itself. Does anybody know that for twig anatomy? What is that? That's a bud scar right there. So it tapped right into the bud scar. <laughs> it's very specific. They have found fossils with bite marks from ants that go back millions and millions of years. The ants didn't survive, the fungus didn't survive, but boy, did the, the marks on the, the, the leaves, the fossilized leaves existed. So this has been going on a long time. This one fused in, you can see how it's uh, fused into the twig, the fungus threads in. Once it kills and secretes the toxin, you know, it gives the ant lockjaw, threads in, and then the mushroom comes out right the back of their head, just like this. And then um, those spores shoot straight down. Right. Um, if this were a terrestrial ant or termite, it gets even worse. The, uh, the guards are actually have specialized antennae, and they are scanning all the workers coming back through, bringing food to the rest of the group, all right? And none of the other workers or the queen, nobody can detect those spores. So the guard is like the TSA at the airport, right? And if they scan one that comes in and it has those infected spores or it's infected, they will latch onto that infected worker and they'll drag it way far away from the nest. And then they will decapitate that worker, chop its head off, dig a hole, and bury the body and the head in the hole in a graveyard. It gets worse. <laughs> The guard, knowing that it touched the infected worker, digs another hole and commits suicide and entombs themselves. They never go back, and then for, before you know it, the Secret Service, one by one, is taken out, and then the queen is a sitting duck, right? So that's how it works. Now, how can you get your hands on some of this fun stuff? <laughs> uh, some of it already exists. This is a botanogard. OMRI approved um, for organic applications. Yeah, fungi are pretty sensitive to UV light. So you would do this uh, in the late afternoon, early evening. Uh, this one, I would call this a more of a broad spectrum entomopathogen because it's listed for many different flying insects. And I'm gonna tell you how to improve on that. Botanic art. You could spray your field